Um, so thanks everybody. My name is Jennifer Hardister um, and thanks for the introduction, Jen. Um, I, I wanted to do, uh, when Jennifer asked me about doing a um, CLE on mediation, um, I wanted to do something about kind of how not to get caught up in some of the um, pitfalls that can uh, happen when parties are um, either forced to go to mediation or potentially they just choose to go to mediation. I've seen it happen so many times. Um, I haven't actually, I don't have a true number of how many mediations I've done. Um, it's hundreds. Um, I don't think it's reached a thousand, but it's a lot um, over the course of my career. And so I've seen a lot of different uh, processes, obviously worked a lot with different mediators. Um, and so I thought what I'd do is kind of go through um, some of the issues that I've seen and, and try also with my mediator training now, um, help try to discuss not, how not to get caught by those pitfalls. Um, so we'll go through these. As Jennifer said, if you have questions, there's a Q&A button that you guys should see. Um, and so don't hesitate to, to ask a question. There's also the chat button, but the Q&A is probably the easiest. And um, you know, don't feel like you're interrupting or anything. I'll just get to it when I get to it. Because um, I want to make sure if anybody has a particular question or a particular example that they want to see discussed, I'm happy to do that. Um, so, let's see if I can let go page down. Or do I have to get Click and draw. Okay. There we go. Okay. So, in terms of setting the tone, I think one of the things that I've learned throughout the years when um, mediating a case, beginning to mediate a case, is it's the preparation, it seems so commonsensical, but the preparation is totally key. Um, and it starts, I think, with choosing a mediator and realizing who or thinking about who is going to be best served to mediate this particular case. Um, and that means for everybody, who is best served to work with the attorneys involved, who is more appropriate to work with the different parties, um, and kind of who is best served to look at the different legal topics in the case. Um, you know, sometimes you'll get lucky and get somebody who crosses every box or checks every box. And sometimes you'll get somebody who, you know, may understand the legal issues in the case, but isn't the, you know, the person that you'd necessarily pick um, to work with the counsel on a particular case or work with the parties. But it's important to think about all of those issues. I can't tell you how many times that I've been in a mediation where the parties themselves were almost immobilized because the mediator wasn't the appropriate mediator for them. They didn't have a connection. There wasn't really um, a, a good dialogue between the two. Um, and it just, it kind of broke things down. So if you feel like you've got a party that um, would respond to, you know, a particular gender better or a particular race um, better, or, you know, sometimes a retired judge is exactly who the parties need because they need somebody with who, who isn't afraid to assert that um, sense of authority. I've seen other cases, though, where a retired judge or a current judge even is not the appropriate person because of that same issue that people don't respond well to that um, sense of authority. So you just have to think about who you have and what kind of case you have. Are you guys seeing? Okay. I just want to make sure that we get some of the, the um, logistical issues for the, the participants resolved. Yeah. So Jennifer Matthew just made a great point, which is for Alaris, um, they get calls a lot from counsel saying, we have this particular case, here's kind of what I'm looking for, can you help us select a mediator? And they are more than willing to do that. 
or even give you know a couple of options and tell about the, the tell the requester about the background of that particular mediator. It helps a lot. Um, so don't hesitate to use your resources and um, and and call Alaris if you need to. Um, don't get caught up in the uh, posturing from people. Um, it, it, I know this is easier said than done, but a lot of times people will not meet or say they won't mediate until you've offered at least $5 million before we're going to schedule a mediation or you have to, I'm going to demand, um, you know, $30 million prior to starting the mediation. Sometimes that is true and sometimes it is a cutoff and you're never going to be able to get beyond that and I get that. But a lot of times it's just kind of posturing to see what the response is. So try not to certainly have a dialogue with the opposing party about why they're offering or why they're doing that, um, but don't try to get caught up about that. And the same goes with demands about pleading um, issues and um, deadlines and, you know, I have to have the excess counsel there or we're not going forward. I mean, it's very difficult to, to not have a visceral response when you have some of those demands. Um, but talking through that, if your ultimate goal is to really see if there's a way to get the case resolved, don't get caught up in, in those demands or offers. Um, do your homework before you arrive. We will talk in more detail about that below in ter or later on in terms of, um, you know, talking about opening statement, talking about mediator statement, um, and really trying to figure out, which is the last bullet point, what's the real issue in the case? Oftentimes, it's not about money, or if it's about money, there's there are sub-issues that really sort of drive where the money's coming from, whether it's emotion, whether it's uh, business interests, um, you know, wanting to re retain a business relationship, not wanting to retain a business relationship. Um, oftentimes, it can be something other than money. Um, I know that I'm going to sound like a psychologist, but I do think there is a huge psychological background to this. Um, you have to think about the environment of, of a mediation itself and the mediator. I talked earlier about, you know, kind of responding to the mediator, him or herself, and responding to whether you feel like you have a choice, you know, especially from uh, the party's perspective feeling safe in a mediation room, having some respect in a mediation room. Um, the FINRA, which is the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, um, so they do a lot of uh, mediations and arbitration for the financial industry, hired an outside consultant in 2018, and I thought this was very interesting. And what, it, what they um, did was, talk to different parties who had been through the mediation and arbitration process to figure out sort of what their big issues were. And a lot of it didn't have anything to do with the particular case that they had. A lot of it had to do with the process of mediation, whether they felt like they were heard during the mediation, whether they felt like they even could talk to anybody who was similar to them. Um, you know, whether they had any, a female mediator or an African American mediator or a um, person of Muslim background as a mediator. Um, so those sorts of issues came out on top when they did this outside um, consulting um, format. I know that, um, of course, I'm a huge fan of pop culture. So Jay-Z um, is involved in litigation when, with the sale of his uh, company, uh, Rokaware to Iconics, and you guys might have heard that in February of this year, he halted, he went to the judge and said, I don't want to, I know that, that we have an agreement or a binding arbitration provision, but I don't want to do that, and I don't think it's fair because the uh, AAA, the American Arbitration Association, doesn't have um, enough African American uh, arbitrators on their panel, and I don't feel like I'm going to get a fair shake. And lo and behold, AAA said, you're right. You know, we don't. We, we had, I think, two out of over 200 at that time. And they made a commitment um, to him and to everyone else using AAA that they would um, increase their diversity in terms of uh, the mediator pan or arbitrator panels that they had. So 
kind of figuring out the, the whole sense of the mediation and setting the tone is um, so important before you're going to do that. I want to talk a little bit about BATNA because when I, um, people had kind of thrown that uh, acronym around and I had no idea um, until I did mediation training what that meant. Um, and it stands for best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Maybe I'm the only one who doesn't know what that is, but I didn't. And essentially what it means is um, you're never going to get a case settled. You're never going to come to some sort of negotiated agreement if there's a better option away from the table. So if somebody has a better option that, you know, through the court system or through some other system, they're never going to negotiate any sort of agreement because sort of what's their, what, what reason do they have to have? And so the purpose for bringing it up here is to figure out for both parties what the other party's BATNA is and keep that in mind when you're making offers. If the other party at a bare minimum um, is guaranteed of you know, getting $200,000 in the courtroom, then why would you offer $100,000 in mediation? Um, you know, similarly, if you've got a huge chance of getting out on summary judgment, why would you participate in a mediation? So, I mean, kind of figuring out what those issues are seem common sense, commonsensical again, but it's important to think about it and figure out what those issues are in your particular case and use them with your mediator. Okay, so preparation matters. Let's talk about that a little bit. So who will be there? You need to make sure that you have the right people at the table and you need to think about it in advance enough to make it happen. So it's very frustrating. I'm sure a lot of you have been there where the day before the mediation comes, everybody starts circulating emails. Oh, I thought so-and-so was gonna be there. Oh, it's really important for that adjuster to be there. Oh, you're not bringing your, your party, why not? Or, you know, why isn't it, why is it that this party is having five other family members there? That's really gonna kind of set things back. So think about that ahead of time and think about whether you allow people to be present or whether it's better if they have some sort of distance between the mediation. Um, and I think it's also important to work with your mediator in advance to kind of set some of those ground rules. Um, you can also think about like lien holders and whether they need to be there. If there's a huge work comp lien, sometimes it helps to have the work comp counsel there at the table so everybody can figure out, everybody can hear the same thing, number one, and everybody can figure out how to get the case resolved. Um, you know, coming from my medical background, a lot of times um, it helps to see the injured party, even if it's a child or a minor. So having kind of arranging for that person to be there makes things much easier. Um, it allows other people, you know, if you have excess counsel or if you have co-defendants who are taking a very um, conservative approach to the case, maybe that will change their mind when they actually see how injured the party is. Um, I've done mediations in people's homes um, you know, have traveled long ways. If they aren't able to travel here, we've done mediations in schools before so that we didn't disturb the, the child from the school. We went to the, what it's whatever special school that the child went to. So kind of think outside the box to make sure that you um, set the tone and, and prepare to have that mediation work for you. I think another thing to think about is it, it seems very, um, uh, rigid in terms, no offense, Jen, but like in terms of how the mediations go, it's probably not a good, it seems that way, perhaps. Formal, that's a better term than rigid, thank you. But it seems like, okay, we start at nine, or gosh, maybe even 9.30, um, and we have it in here, and it's very, it's, it's a very um, expected thing, and that may be fine for the majority of mediations, um, but there may be times where the location changes like we talked about, or sometimes one of the biggest um, advantages, I think, is to start mediation at 1.30. If you know you have an opposing party who cannot make a decision 
at all, or you know, you don't you don't think it's necessary to sit there and listen to eight hours of, you know, here's what you did and here's how this is working and we're not doing anything and you need to come, you know, up with more money. Maybe you start at 1:30. Um, I should have probably gotten permission before I'm saying that, making this suggestion, but I mean, it really does make a difference sometimes because it forces people to be a little more compact. Um, same, I mean, it's a common theme that we see with uh, adjusters. Well, I've got to catch a plane. I've got to get out of here by two o'clock. Well, you know, kind of flip it on them. Let's start at 1.30 then because nobody wants to be around at nine o'clock at night still mediating. Not that we haven't done that either. Um, I think you can ask the mediator to set some ground rules as well. Um, maybe use that, your opening, um, not your opening, your mediator um, submission to ask the mediator if you've got certain ground rules, like you don't want people to leave, you want people to be there, you need to have this person there. I think that's helpful. Um, in terms of a mediator submission, I think one of the key things that people need to to keep in mind is that it's supposed to be geared toward settlement. Usually, I mean, I understand if it's court ordered, it might not come off that way, but if it's truly, if the goal is truly to try and get the case settled, then the mediator submission should be designed to help the mediator understand what the issues are in the case and how, the, how you feel the case could get settled. Um, you know, just coming up with paragraph after paragraph after paragraph of how the other side isn't fair and they're lying and this is never going to work, that's not helpful. Um, and I've seen way too many of those mediator submissions. Um, it, it's much better to say, here are the pros, here are the cons, here are the, you know, he, talking about BATNA again, here are the things that the issues that the other side I think should think about, here are the issues we need to think about. It doesn't mean it's a weak um, or a, a weak um, position to say your weaknesses to a mediator. It's designed to help the mediator get the case settled. Um, let's talk a little bit about sort of opening statements, caucuses, you know, um, keep, keeping people in the room in the beginning and sort of what's useful about that and what might be a little harmful about that. It's certainly gonna depend on the particular case. Um, I think there, there really have been few and far cases in between where I haven't seen at least some sort of opening remarks um, not be helpful. Like there, let me say that in a better way. I can think of only a couple of cases where I really thought that it would be dangerous or just really um, downright harmful to have some sort of opening remark. The vast majority of cases, even if everybody just goes in the room, people call it usually a meet and greet and say, hello, um, here are the people here. We're trying to get this case resolved. Thank you very much for coming here. At the bare minimum, I would strongly suggest doing that. And then I think it is a um, it is an individual decision in terms of how big of an opening statement to have. Um, my record for sitting through an opening statement is about two hours and I think it was two hours and forty seven minutes um, of an opening statement where a lot of it was watching video of a focus group that the other side had done. Um, and kind of sitting there through the focus group um, and um, just watching it. Not a lot of uh, interaction by any stretch, but it also was integrated into a PowerPoint. I can tell you, we, we had to take several breaks during the time. It was very frustrating. And truthfully, I try to be objective about it. Truthfully, I don't think it helped matters at all. We'd already, all the parties had seen the PowerPoint in advance anyway. Um, so it wasn't new information. And even if, it, even if we hadn't seen the, the focus group video, kind of editing it down to a couple of brief snippets, I think would have been a lot a more effective way of getting through some of those um, presentation points. 
I think the best way to be helpful in an opening statement is to figure out what points you're trying to make with the other side. And you guys might say, well, that's great. That's really easy. You know, we, we already know that. But I think it's hard to think of those and be objective about it when you are so enmeshed in the case. And so what I would suggest is getting feedback about it. So keep it down to five or six slides, make an outline, figure out your good points, and then get feedback from somebody who has no idea what the case is about. Does it make sense? Is it crisp? Is it um, antagonistic? Or is it meant to, again, focus on the issue of getting the case resolved? And if you can do that, the, those PowerPoints or other presentation materials have been some of the most effective that I've ever seen. The ones that I've seen have been, again, five to six slides that tend to be the most effective ones. If you're going to use bills, liens, records, documents, um, if you've got some sort of special calculation, it's helpful, again, to get those not only to the other parties, but also to the mediator in advance. So if there are issues to work through, if there are liens to work through, if somebody has a question about the, the records of whether are these, does one party have records that the other party doesn't, vice versa, is there an issue with the calculation? It's, it's helpful to get all of those worked out in advance. I get that there might be certain times where you might wanna not show them in advance, but I think for the most part, it's helpful to, to have everybody have an opportunity in advance to take a look at that so you're not wasting time trying to get a hold of somebody, trying to get somebody to fax it or email it or whatever, um, and wasting time in the actual mediation. Always be aware of what's really at issue in the mediation. Um, sometimes it can help resolve the matter um, or figure out how to move forward, but you, I get that you can't always ask it directly. And so I think it's important, and I know it's the last bullet point on here, but I think it's always important to kind of listen for cues or hints or um, what people are actually telling you, because it's, it's, it's frequent that we're in mediation, looking at the numbers, trying to get things done, doing 15 other things about other, on other cases that we're trying to keep up with. And oftentimes we don't stop and actually listen to what the other side is saying, sometimes it really can help resolve the matter. Um, so, some, and sometimes it can hit you in the face. I had a mediation once where we walked into the room and the opposing party, of course, mine, most, a lot of mine dealt with um, medical issues, which can be very emotional anyway. Um, but we walked into the room and the entire conference room table was covered with picture, family pictures, pictures of the um, plaintiff's deceased father. Um, and so it was really hard to miss that cue because we had to look at those pictures and listen to the family stories pretty much most of the day. So that's very easy. You can see the verbal cues. You know what the issues are. You know that this, this is gonna be a really um, difficult uh, Thing for this family to get through. Other times you can't always tell. I had another case that's sort of the opposite of that where it, it also involved a family um, death um, of a, a, a little guy. He was five years old and the family um, couldn't really articulate why they didn't want to settle. They just didn't want to, to get rid of the case even though even the mediator and even their counsel thought that we had offered um, kind of more than appropriate money to get the case resolved and they couldn't really articulate it. And so we ended up having a caucus of everybody together because we were all flummoxed about why this wasn't getting done. And it really, um, come to find out, it was because this was sort of, they felt this was their connection to their son and they didn't want to let it go. And so we were, we ended up doing something different for
for that family in terms of trying to find some way to memorial to memorialize their son in a way that my gosh wasn't litigation like that's that's horrible that you wouldn't want to connect those but we were able to come together and figure out a way to help them get past the inability to to resolve the case and we couldn't really ask I mean, if you would have asked them directly, what's your issue? They couldn't articulate it. You, we really had to listen to what they were saying and come to a way to figure out a, kind of a unique way of how to resolve what their, their issue was. Um, client prep and participation. I don't, I don't know about all of you guys, but I would say in my experience, it's fairly rare to have client participation in a mediation, but that said, or at least minimal participation is, is not unusual, but to be really a participant or asking questions, you know, um, talking, that, that to me is pretty unusual. And I think if you're gonna do that, or if you know that it's gonna be part of the mediation, I think preparation is a huge part of that um, because mediations for, for attorneys can even be stressful much less for people who are not used to it. And again, I think it's an area where you can ask the mediator, if you know that you've got a particularly um, emotional or volatile client and you need the mediator's help, that's that preparation and alerting the mediator is, is key. Um, we had a case once where the, um, the father was extraordinarily upset about what happened and told all of us, including the mediator, that he hoped our firstborn child died um, so that we would know what was going through it. And literally it came to a, a standstill, the mediation did. And the mediator was great because he said, you know what, I think everybody needs to take a deep breath. We need to kind of go into separate rooms. And it was really difficult to have everybody kind of get past that and come to see that that was a response um, that was drawn out of um, frustration with the process. And let's keep going and seeing if we can see if we can get the case resolved. Um, so, kind of preparing your client of what to what typically happens is so key. And if you've got somebody that you know is going to be an issue letting your mediator know is also very important. Um, so I had a case um, early on in my career where we had, I, I think there were four, 14 or 13 defendants um, and, and literally everybody had some exposure. And so we ended up doing a pre-mediation mediation. And I have been a true believer ever since because if there are issues and lots of parties and you've got contribution issues and you've got finger pointing issues or maybe you think you have finger pointing issues um, it certainly can help pare things down prior to the actual mediation i was talking with somebody yesterday who was in a mediation on tuesday um, and they they were there for 12 hours and there was not one offer from the opposing set of parties because they had not, they could not still agree on contribution issues and how best to move forward. So the entire group, including the mediator, wasted 12 hours with no movement at all. And that could have at least you could have gotten a heads up had there been a pre-mediation mediation. mediation. Um, have you guys had that before, Jen? Like had the... So Jen said that she had an experience on Monday where they should have done the pre-mediation mediation because they spent more time kind of going through the other, the, the one set of parties um, and didn't get a lot of movement um, 
and they should have done the pre-mediation mediation. And then she asks a question, two follow-up questions. Do you tell the opposing side that you're going to do that? Um, you know, I've done it both ways. I've actually done some where we didn't let them know because, I mean, it just didn't seem like, I mean, there certainly would be times, I think, where you wouldn't want to clue them in that there are issues and you haven't done, an, you haven't either, you haven't done depositions or you've, you know, everybody's been on their best behavior during the depositions, so nobody knows that there are issues yet. And in those cases, I haven't, we haven't let them know. But sometimes, I mean, you know, frankly, I think it can help. Because I think if the opposing side knows that you're working this hard to try and get to a place where you can come to a mediation prepared, I think it kind of takes a lot of the um, angst from the other side out of it. Um, and then the other question is, do you use the same uh, neutral? And in all cases, I think we had one where we didn't, but it was more of a timing issue, not that we wouldn't have used the neutral, but we've always used the same neutral. Um, and, you know, it does, and we'll get to confidentiality later, like it does have some kind of, or it could potentially present some unique um, situations with confidentiality because you have to be very careful what you say in that pre-mediation and how much the neutral could um, clue everybody in on the subsequent mediation. Um, but I think, again, with a lot of um, prep about that, you can get past those issues. Okay, so strategies. Where to start and how to move around. Um, figure out where you want to end up and you don't need to always follow the other party's lead. So it's, it's interesting to me because I get asked a lot well, where do you think this case is worth? Where do you think I should start? And, and if I say, you know, if we talk through this, the, the issues and I say, how about X? Well, the other party did Y. And so I think I'm just going to come down whatever they went up. And, and that's okay in some areas, but it also, I think, um, it, it kind of, you have to be mindful of what the bigger picture is. Um, so, if, and that's, that comes into, you know, where to start, whether it's a demand, okay, well, I'm going to demand the, the policy limits plus, you know, $50 million for punitive damages. Well, what message is that sending to somebody? And you may not care about the message, but I think it kind of, it helps set the tone. And if that's the tone you want to set, okay. But if your goal is to get the case resolved, I'm not sure that that tone is necessarily where you want to start. And similarly, you have to understand that if you're asking for essentially maybe even more than they could even get in the courtroom, and then the other party comes back and says, well, that's fine, then we'll offer $5,000. I mean, it, it just starts everything off on a really um, awkward bent. And you don't need to always do that. I mean. We've had cases before where the opposing party starts at a huge, um, again, more than they, they could ever recover in the courtroom. And instead of saying, well, that's fine, and, you know, kind of getting huffy about it, you know what, we're not going to get involved in that. We, here are the facts, and this is where we want to start. You don't always have to follow the other party's lead. You don't always have to come down 5,000 if they've gone up 5,000 or vice versa. You, you need to think about for your particular case, what your end goal is and, and kind of focus on that. I think it's also important if you've got a case, whether it's a um, med mal case, of course, those are the ones I'm used to, or um, whether it's a business um, situation or you know whatever the, the car accident, if there truly is a reason for you to apologize, then apologize. I think it can totally help break the ice because people don't expect it. Because I think there's still a stigma about people saying they're sorry. Um, and it doesn't mean that I'm sorry, here's all my money. I'm sorry, you've automatically won. It doesn't mean that. And, it, and, and your words don't have to even convey that. But simply saying, you know what? I'm really sorry. I'm sorry you're here. I'm sorry we have to do this. Um, it really is kind of the only way that we have to 
evaluate this sort of litigation, but we're here and we're really committed to making things um, be resolved if you guys are too. And we really appreciate if you, if you would be the same way. That kind of can cut through some of the animosity or some of the um, harshness uh, that people can perceive with mediation. And I think generally mediation isn't necessarily perceived that way, but it can be. And again, it goes back to, it depends on what tone you set. If you've got a judge, that's great, but you know, that sort of, it can be a kind of akin to litigation. You're in a room, you're at a square table that kind of looks a little daunting, but kind of cutting that with, we're all here, we're all focused on you, everybody today in this case, and we're trying to get the case resolved, I think can go a long way in setting the tone that you wanna set. Um, I wanna talk about brackets a little bit because I think that <laughs> brackets have made me giggle for a long time. And I, have, I think it's because I have been in so many mediations where five minutes in, they're like, what are your brackets gonna be? And I just, it, it just, I, I, it makes me speechless every time because I, I think brackets are an important tool, um, but I don't think that in my personal opinion, I think they're useful in really kind of limited situations. Like if you're at a standstill or if people are so um, struggling with how to get um, what the value of the case is, it may be useful to, to look at a bracket um, but generally speaking, I think it's important to kind of talk through the issues first and start with numbers. And if they don't work or if you're at an impasse, then maybe go to a bracket situation. Um, I have trust your gut because I think that's true. I mean, if people are asking about brackets and you really don't feel like that's where you want to go, then trust your gut and ask the mediator. You can always listen to the mediator's cues. Um, assuming you don't have a huge bracket lover mediator, but you can always listen to the mediator's cues about, yeah, I don't, I don't know that this is, even if they have a bracket, even if the other side says, oh, I want to do a bracket, doesn't mean you have to respond with a bracket. And, you know, the mediator, listen to what the mediator says about whether a bracket's appropriate or not appropriate. I mean, the other things for an impasse too, don't always have to do with brackets. I mean, a lot of times I think if you're at Sort of a standstill, it can be helpful to kind of revisit the issues. And are there sub issues to the main issues that you can talk about? So if the big issue is, you know, there's a motion for summary judgment set for hearing next month. So why are we here? And why should I bother be participating in this mediation when I know that my summary judgment, I'm really confident and I think we're going to win, it's going to be heard next month. But if you look at, take the summary judgment motion out, but look at some of the sub issues that are involved in that particular motion, you may find that you have common ground and you can kind of start talking through some of the sub issues and, and use it to move forward. Um, one of the other sort of, uh, not controversial, maybe that's too strong of a word, but uh, moves that a mediator can do is ask to speak to the lawyers themselves and take the lawyers out of the room. Um, and I'll, I'll confess something. When I was a, a young lawyer um, in the mediation as a client, um, it first kind of got under my skin. Like, I'm a lawyer too. Why can't I go with you? Um, but at the, as I got more mature and better uh, educated, I do think it can serve an important purpose to get the, the lawyers together, figure out whether there are any true legal issues involved. They can take it back to their client and then work through some of the other issues. I do think that if you're at a standstill, it can sometimes help to, to have the attorneys convene um, and see if there can be any movement. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's just going to be that the mediation doesn't work um, or that you just, it's too early. You've been ordered and you've been ordered to mediation and it's, it's not a good time or that you have, um, you know, some sort of discovery that you need to do. I mean, any of those issues um, can, 
can call for a reconvening of the mediation. Maybe a case can't isn't ripe for settling uh, in June, but it's it'll settle in October. Not that I have any personal experience with that or anything. Um, and maybe you need to reconvene when you have another party available, or you you know have the the claims person talks to 15 other people in his or her organization and finally gets the authority that they should have had in day one, then you can mediate. So if you have all of those, it doesn't mean that your mediation is not successful. It just may mean that there's not um, the right time for it. Okay, so this, this has a personal meaning to me. So this is at UC San Diego campus, but I love how their Department of Engineering um, uh, building has that house built on it and <laughs> I know I'm a total nerd but the the uh the reason behind it is because like like the beauty is everywhere even in strange things and that's why they have that house built there I think it's also so that the engineering students could have proven that they could do something like that um, but it does make you look twice and to me, that's an important strategy that I think um, people can use during mediations. It's the beauty of weird numbers. Um, we, I have had several mediations through the course of my career where for whatever reason, whether it's um, a lot of them have been religious reasons, but other, other times it's just been like a strange family connection to a certain number that the, whatever the ultimate settlement value uh, for a particular case had to include that number. I, mm -hmm. Yeah, one was the number four, which I really like the number four, um, but yes, it, it's been kind of odd. But the beauty of it is it does make every everybody kind of step back a little bit and focus on, okay, well, let's try to, you know, let's figure it out. Let's focus on how to get the case resolved, even if we have to have a number four in it or whatever number it is. Um, and the same thing, like if you're gonna, I don't know, it just works. Seven figures, yes. Somebody said their settlement has to have seven figures. That also could be, yeah, the decimal point makes a huge difference. Um, but truly, like if you know that you've got medical bills or if you've got a work comp lien of X dollars and, you know, you can somehow incorporate that into your offer or into your response, it does make everybody sort of stand back and, and focus on try to get, trying to get the case resolved. Um, High-low agreements. So if the mediation is not successful, um, it's, it can be useful to think about, like if you know kind of going towards your end of the mediation, it can be useful to think about, okay, should we reconvene for another day? Should we figure out some other way to have an agreement that we could um, agree upon in terms of the, the case going to trial? And a high-low agreement is one of those things. If you know that your mediation, if you can see that it's not gonna succeed and you're really confident, either the trial's coming up really quickly, or you're confident that, that you know, another mediation isn't gonna be successful, that people are really just, this is just gonna be one of those cases that the mediation doesn't work, try thinking about a high-low agreement. That can also be useful in trying to kind of come to some agreement with your opposing party. If the case does settle, I think it's really helpful in talking about mediation prep really helpful before the mediation itself to have discussed what the settlement terms are, whether it's if you discuss it with the other party, that's fine, if, but at least discuss it among the party, the individual parties. And also if you have sample language, it's nice to save everybody some time. The worst thing in the world um, is if a case resolves, the parties think they have an agreement, they try to write it out and either people at that point start saying, well, that's not what I agreed to. Well, I didn't understand that the settlement included that. Um, well, your settlement language says confidentiality, but two weeks later, they're after the mediation, everybody's gone back to their respective offices and they have very different ideas of what confidentiality means, what lien waivers mean. So it's so helpful to have that in advance, um, have the sample language there 
have a release prepared, have, you know, whatever, so that you are not, that you can truly say that you're, everybody is actually making an agreement based on this, um, you know, these uh, phrases or this language. It's, it's truly helpful. Um, if the mediation doesn't settle, I mean, there are a variety of ways, what the, the variety of reasons why it doesn't settle, what the, what the literature says, um, it will not surprise anyone. Um, the reasons usually have to do with people being unprepared, um, people having truly different opinions about the case, um, having a mediation too soon, uh, people being unreasonable and truly unreasonable, not just that you're saying they're unreasonable. Um, and then people not having the authority to enter into the agreement or not having the settlement authority either. Um, but that said, I think a mediation, mediation process works a lot of the time. Um, I know my stats were higher than 95 or 90, I think it was like 94%. Um, but, and not that it settled that at the day of mediation by any stretch. Um, a lot of them didn't, but persistence is such the key. Um, you know, in, it can still help, even if the case doesn't settle, um, it can still help getting the case resolved if you stay on it and consider your mute, uh, neutral and your mediator in helping you stay on it. Um, engage that mediator and, and make, especially if you think he or she did a good job, obviously, and, and have that mediator continually reaching out to people and saying, how can I help? How can I get this resolved? Do we need to mediate again? What's going on in your, your case? Um, it helps the judge too to, to know that the parties are still engaged in trying to get the case resolved. Even if a mediation is not successful, I think you can still, in terms of actual, the case actually resolving, I still think it can help with other aspects of the conflict. I think it can help people get different perspectives on the case, whether it's from the mediator, whether it's from counsel who maybe not be maybe isn't available necessarily and you haven't talked to them before but here they are at the mediation and now they give you new perspectives on the case um, you can get clues about the other side's um, perspective on the case and what their thinking is and what their strategy is and you can go back to the judge which i think is always helpful and say judge we mediated it um, we gave it a, an honest effort and it just wasn't successful so all of those things, I think, even if the mediation doesn't result in a settlement, it can still help with other aspects of the, the conflict. And the last thing I want to talk about is confidentiality um, in the mediation process. Um, so again, I think, um, I think there's been a little shift, at least in, in my experience. It used to be that when you went into mediation, um, you know, everything was kept confidential and that's sort of how the neutral let off. We're going to keep everything confidential. And then there were, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to do that because as a neutral, it's hard to know, okay, what facts or what arguments or what strategy is confidential, meaning I can never tell the other side, or what is it just confidential in terms of just being in this mediation? So what I like to say, either as a mediator or as a participant, is everything that we say in this actual mediation, the mediation process, is confidential. But while we're here, while we're all in this room, while we're in our separate rooms, everything, I'm going to assume that everything we tell the mediator is not confidential for purposes of the mediation, except if we specifically say it is that makes it a lot easier for everybody to know and to highlight, okay, I can talk about everything with that other party except for these three things. It really kind of narrows it down and pro provides a very specific um, piece of guidance for the neutral. I've been in, in some mediations where it wasn't, we didn't clarify it like we should have, and the, the neutral was kind of loose with what the facts shared were. And it, it's difficult because then the other party, you know, gets a piece of information that you didn't intend them to get. 
Um, and that same thing should go, you, you should be able to define this mediation in this particular room, any pre-mediation um, meetings that you've had or a pre-mediation mediation that you've had, and then also beyond too. If the case continues and you're continuing to work with the neutral, you need to define what main, what facts are uh, confidential for what particular circumstance and be pretty darn specific about it so that there's no room for misinterpretation or that the, the, the neutral doesn't assume that there is um, a, a fact that he or she can share that really shouldn't have been shared. So that's all I have, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the um, attending. Does anybody have any questions? Hmm. Um, talking about confidentiality in the mediation. What about, um, I've had it where in open court after the mediation, the, one of the parties said to the judge, well, they stopped, they, they stopped at this number and the judge got furious that it wasn't accepted. What do you do about that? So the question, somebody here asked a question and the, the issue was after the mediation at the settlement approval, one of the parties said in open court, well, you stopped at X number um, before the case settled. Oh, it was a report to the judge. It wasn't even during the settlement approval conference. So what do you do about that? Um, well, it was uttered in open court, so I don't know that you can do a whole heck of a lot other than um, try to seal whatever record of that particular um, hearing that you have, but if it's not a settlement approval hearing, you're not going to have any numbers. I mean, I don't know that you can do anything about it. Yeah, I don't think you can do anything about it other than be really aggravated. Um, but so we have had situations, though, where the whole, the intent of people in the mediation, what they reached a settlement, they intended to keep it confidential, including the facts and circumstances leading up to the settlement and what the settlement amount was. And then we get to the settlement approval and the judge is like, either has it in open court where everybody can hear it. And at that point, I think the parties can say, judge, would you mind if we um, either went back into your chambers or cleared the courtroom or whatever. Um, and we've actually had judges say, eh, no, mm -mm, not doing it. And I don't know that you have a lot of options at that point. Kind of stinks. Yeah. I mean, I think you can do what you can do and control it how we can control it on the, the confidentiality parameters for the mediation and the, the agreement. That's about all we can control. A valid reason, yeah. So the question is, um, every once in a while, it becomes clear that one of the parties attending the mediation is um, attending it probably with a, a little different idea in mind, more of a fishing expedition as opposed to truly trying to reach a settlement in the case. And what would you do about that? Um, as a mediator, I would confront it pretty directly and say, try to ask questions designed to elicit um, whether they really truly are there for the settlement purposes. And if it is a clear fishing expedition, I would probably end the mediation um, and potentially report it back to the judge about what happened. Or, um, you know, my guess is the other party would report it back to the judge as well. But I think it's very important to confront that directly. I mean, that's not why, that's not the purpose of a mediation or a neutral or anything like that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Everybody has to hear, to be here in good faith. Everybody's been accused of not being here in good faith. And it's really hard to, you know, tease out whether somebody is truly acting in bad faith. But I, but I think if you've got enough um, of a reason to think that they're really not there in, in good faith, I think then you, it doesn't mean you can't reconvene, but you end the mediation as a neutral at that point and 
and see if it can be reconvened later if it's truly something that the parties, both parties are interested in. No. So the the issue is in federal court, um, you have to file a certificate of attendance, and and actually I think it has to be a little more um, like even a, a somewhat of a report, although I don't think it has to be long. But just generally saying, here's the mediation, here are the attendance, here's what happened. And there is a requirement on the neutral to report if um, the, uh, one of the parties has uh, appeared and participated in bad faith, or I forget what the language is. And one of the parties um, has uh, reported or had on the neutral to say in that report, um, this party didn't, the other party did not appear in good faith, and the neutral was very um, opposed to doing that. And so my response to that would be, uh, that's not appropriate for parties. It's, it's really the neutral's report. And I think the, um, we actually talked about this in mediator training, and um, one of the uh, neutrals at the University of Columbia at Mizzou, or University of Missouri at Columbia, um, said that they had actually gone, had also been pressured to report back to the federal judge and had actually gone back to the judge and said, I did not feel like there was bad faith. I am very uncomfortable. Here's my report. And by the way, you know, this is, this is what they asked me to do and I was not comfortable doing that. I mean, I don't know if that's necessary in every circumstance, um, but I certainly wouldn't put something on there that I'm not comfortable with. Yeah, um, it, um, <laughs> that's true. So <laughs> um, we have seen, there have been cases, true, where the um, neutral does not file the certificate because there has been bad faith. Although I, well, and I'm sure it depends on the judge as to whether the judge is going to follow back up. Um, and I'm sure some of them do and some of them don't. I would, I would, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I've always, they've always followed up in cases that I've been involved in. Yeah. So I, I would be hesitant not to follow, file a report. I don't know. That's just me. Yeah, I, I wouldn't doubt that in the least. Nope. Thank you everybody for participating and I think we will sign off at that point. Thanks.